In Mark chapter 9, we've got a story where there's a little bit of a passing around of responsibility for something that's happened. Uh, we pick up the, the, the story in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. Because my bookmark fell out, give me a chance to get there. Mark chapter 9, it's starting in verse 14. The story goes like this. Jesus has just been up on the mountain and he's taken his sort of leadership team um, up there with him. And uh, he's been transfigured and he's hung out with, you know, Elijah and Moses and had a pretty awesome time, I would imagine. And he comes down from the hill. And as he comes down the hill, there's this scenario where the other disciples are there and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and these religious leaders are around them. And they're having an argument with these uh, other disciples as Jesus comes down the hill. And it says in verse, where are we? Verse 14, when they came to the other disciples came down the mountain. They saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Now, we don't know what they were arguing with them about. There's no context or we're not given any of that information. But as the story unfolds, we could potentially assume Maybe what the argument was about was the Pharisees and the religious leaders were thinking, okay, Jesus is gone. The leadership team is gone. Here's our chance to get into the ears of the other disciples. And, and, and perhaps what they were doing was using this opportunity of what had just happened. You see, there's a man that had brought his child to the disciples. This child was uh, possessed by a demon spirit. The disciples of Jesus go back earlier in Mark. They've been given authority to deal with this sort of stuff. But for whatever reason, it says that they couldn't deal with this particular situation. They were unable to set this young boy free and cast out this demonic spirit. And so maybe the Pharisees and the Sadducees were using this opportunity to get around the other disciples and to go, you know what? Here's the deal. I told you, Jesus isn't the son of God. Don't listen to his teaching. Who cares what he said you got? Blah, 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 blah. Whose responsibility does this is failing lie with? It, it, it falls with Jesus. Why are you following this guy? We don't know exactly what they were talking about, but maybe that was the context. They were using this opportunity to get to the disciples and to try to say, hey, this is Jesus' fault. That didn't happen because don't listen to this man. He's not who he claims to be. But then the story goes on a little bit further. And it says uh, in verse 5, it says, So Peter said to Jesus, uh, sorry, where am I? 14, going on to 16. Jesus says, what are you arguing with them about? And a man in the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that's robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. So here are the Pharisees and Sadducees in the ears of the disciples, possibly, potentially saying, this is Jesus' fault. He, he, stop following his teaching. Stop listening. This failure to cast out this demon, it's the fault of Jesus. But then this man runs up to Jesus and goes, well, I, I brought this boy along here, and, and the failure rests with your disciples. They couldn't cast him out. So the responsibility for the failing right there, he said, no, 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 it's the disciples' fault. They couldn't cast out this spirit. You can see this passing around of whose responsibility is it at the end of the day. And then it says this. Jesus says in verse 19, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you, and how long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Now Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It's often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus responds this way. He says, if you can. He's speaking now to the father. He says, if you can. He says, everything is possible for one who believes. So you've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees potentially saying, here's a situation, this boy was not set free, it's, it's the teaching of Jesus maybe. It's all wrong. It's, it's baloney. Don't listen to this guy. He's not worth listening to, he's not worth following, it doesn't work. The stuff he says doesn't work. Then you've got the father saying, it's the disciples' fault. They couldn't cast this spirit out. So, so responsibility for the failure or, or for this breakthrough not happening, whatever you want to call it, it rests with the disciples. But Jesus has this way of kind of flipping it a little bit, doesn't he? And I've got to be brutally honest with you. I don't like a lot of what Jesus teaches. I'm just being brutally honest. I don't like it. I don't like it when Jesus puts responsibility on an individual or on me. And in particular, here's the thing. I don't like, one of my least favorite phrases in the Bible is according to your faith. I don't like it. Or if you have faith. I don't like it. And I don't like Jesus' response to this man. If you can believe, all things are possible. 
He's addressing the Father. It's almost like Jesus is saying, okay, we can point fingers everywhere else, but maybe, just maybe, there's an element in this whole picture where I'm not saying it's not partly this, I'm not saying it's not partly that, just like you all agreed with me. It's not completely my fault. It's partly Nick's fault, yeah? It's partly Chloe. It's partly Jackie. It's partly Sarah. But <laughs> at the end of the day, I've got to take some responsibility too. And quite often when Jesus talked about faith, and I don't like this any more than you probably do. It's almost as if he put a little bit of expectation on the individuals that followed him and said, you know what? I'm expecting a little belief out of you. I'm expecting a little faith and trust out of you. I don't like it. I don't like it. But it's true. You know, at the beginning of this year, I, we had a combined churches prayer meeting here and just my own thinking and my own praying and as a leadership team praying and so on, the things I'm hearing. And one of the things that really stood out for me for this year is this word expectation. I, I think I might have preached a couple of weeks ago before we went on holidays about expectation. And, I, and it's still there inside of me that I, I believe God wants us to raise back up again with expectation. Amen? I think God wants us. There's, there's almost this sense where we've, we've all just lowered. I mean, we live in a world that's lowering expectation, isn't it? We're lowering expectation. You, 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 you go to a sporting event with, with children and everybody gets a ribbon. It's like everybody won. I don't have a problem. I, you know, I understand we want everyone to feel good and so on, but what does it kind of do to the guy that wants to strive to be the best? What's the point? I'm just going to end up the same as everybody else anyway. So it kind of creates this mediocrity in life. And we see it all around the place at the moment. In order to make everybody happy, make everybody feel good, uh, it, 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 it happens. Don't get me started on that. But it creates this world of mediocrity where what's the point in striving? What's the point in trying to be the best? What's the point in trying to improve? What's, I mean, we're all going to just land in the same place anyway because everyone around us is going to make sure we... But I think God wants us to rise up with expectation. I think God wants to have a bunch of people that say, hey, yeah, I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. A little bit like Daniel, that, that, that beautiful song we sung today. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David said, I would have lost hope. I would have completely lost hope if I didn't actually have something inside of me, a, a semblance of faith or belief that, you know what, this God that said, let there be and there was, if I didn't have some semblance of belief that that God could do something tangible, evidential, somehow invade my world, this side of heaven, if I didn't have that, it would just be hard slog from start to finish. But there's something in me that hangs on to the belief that I could see and experience God down here. I don't have to wait for the sweet by and by, wait till I die, and then when I get... No, no, God wants to engage himself with our world now. God wants to be a part of our world, a part of not just my Sunday morning church world. He wants to be a part of my whole world. He wants to be a part of my experience at school. He wants to be a part of my experience uh, in my marriage. He wants to be part of the experience when I go and play sport. He wants to be part of the experience in my work. He wants to be a part of all those areas of my world, not decompartmentalize my spiritual life. Jesus, you got the spiritual side of me, but the rest of it's all mine. He wants to be a part of our whole world. And, and and I wonder, I just wonder whether, particularly with what we've gone through, whether that kind of sense of expectation has dulled and died. But I really do believe God's saying, you know, let's raise that sense of expectation corporately and even individually. Anything that happens corporately begins individually. Who knows that? You know, people talk about the power of, 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 of uh, you know, when the church all comes together. Well, you know what? You can get a bunch of lukewarm, half-hearted, don't-care Christians together in a room and you'll have pretty much no power. But you get a bunch of people in a room that are passionate with their faith, that actually believe that God can do things, that actually believe God is meeting with them, that actually believe God is in that place, and you can get a lot of stuff happening in an environment like that. I don't like this. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me because Jesus said, where two or more are gathered, I'm there in their midst. He's with us when we're one or one by ourselves. But for some reason, Jesus just wanted us all to know when there's more than one of you gathered, there's just something extra special about it. Don't shoot the messenger. It's, <laughs> get mad at Jesus. But I just wonder, I just wonder whether with this thing of expectation, whether God really wants to challenge us, hey, let's, let's begin to, to believe again. Now, with that comes this challenge. When Jesus says, if you have faith, it opens up the question, well, what exactly is faith? What is faith? What is faith? So what we're going to do for the next four or five weeks is we're going to dance around this topic of faith. 
And what I'm hoping and praying for is that for some of us, we'll get a fresh revelation of what faith is and also what faith is not. And that something will spark on the inside of us. Because Jesus made this amazing statement. Remember that story where, where he went past the fig tree? Remember that? And he cursed the fig tree. And the next day they walked past the tree and the tree's dead. And the disciples say, dude, how did that happen? And Jesus says, you know, you only need faith the size of a mustard seed. Isn't it funny? We, 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 we kind of, when we think of faith, we think of this big, we need this huge amount. Jesus said, man, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you just need a speck of the stuff. And great things become possible in life. So I'm hoping and praying over these next few weeks that a little bit of a spark goes off on the inside of us. And that maybe we re-examine where is our faith actually at? Do we have faith? And, and by faith, I mean, do we actually have biblical faith? What the Bible talks about that faith is. And so why are we going to spend so much time on it? I just want to give you really quickly, and I'm going to finish up, like I said, just a quick introduction here this morning. I want to give you five real quick reasons why we're going to be talking about faith for the next five weeks. And and here it is. Reason number one, because God has an expectation that his followers will have it. Isn't that true? One thing you cannot escape in the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one thing you cannot escape is the, 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 the fact that Jesus wants his followers to have this thing called faith. You just can't escape it. doesn't matter how you read it. There's this expectation, a healthy expectation on the part of God that his followers actually have faith. You ever thought about that? There's this healthy expectation on the part of God that we would actually have faith. In Mark 4, 40, after calming the storm, remember the disciples are in the boat and it's going all crazy. Jesus calms the storm and then he turns to the disciples and says, where was your faith? In other words, you've, you, you spent a little bit of time with me. By now I'm expecting something from you. I'm expecting you to have a little bit of this thing we call faith. Where is your faith? In Mark 6, verse 6, after being unable to perform any miracles, he goes back to Nazareth and he can't perform miracles, and he actually says there that he marveled at their unbelief. It's like, hang on a second, I've I've been around for a bit now, you've heard, you've seen a bit, you've sampled a bit. Where's your faith? How can you not have any faith at all? In Mark 16, 14, after the resurrection, after he's been raised from the dead, and the eyewitnesses come and tell a bunch of people, the disciples, hey, Jesus is resurrected, and they're still not believing. And then he appears to them, and when he appears, he rebuked them for their lack of faith. There's this sense we can't escape where Jesus says to his followers, you know what, I actually have a healthy expectation that when you hang around me, you're going to start to build this thing that we call faith. So the first reason why we're going to talk about it for the next few weeks is because God has an expectation that his followers will have faith. Now, some of you sitting here, you might get really angry about that. How dare God have an expectation of faith? Hey, again, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what these ancient writers recorded for us. And personally, I don't like it. I, 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 I wish it wasn't there, but I can't escape the fact that when I personalize it, God, you're looking at me and you're expecting that as I journey with you that I'm developing this thing called faith. Number two, because without faith, we'll never be truly pleasing to God. Who knows that? Hebrews 11.6, without faith, it's what? One person says it. Without faith, it's what? I can only hear Jackie. Without faith, it's going to be kind of difficult. Is that what it says? Without faith, it's going to be kind of awkward. Without faith, you're going to struggle a little, but you just might get there in the end. He says, without faith, it is impossible. To please God. This is the same uh, God that says, with faith, all things become possible. So faith means all things become possible. Without faith means all things become impossible. And it means that I can't please God. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because how many of us think that faith is a means by which we get through the next difficulty in our life? I just need faith to get through the next difficulty. Well, here's the, da- here's the bad news for you. If without faith it's impossible to please God, please don't ever think you're going to get to a point where you don't need faith. Because if you get to a point where you don't need faith, what you're admitting is now I'm in a place where I'm not really pleasing to God. Because God wants you to please him, doesn't it make sense that your life is going to continually be putting you in situations and circumstances where you need faith? Because God wants us to please him. So I'm always going to be in situations where I need faith. Some of us feel like the journey of faith is get to know God that well and his word that well, that we'll one day get to this utopic place where we don't need faith anymore. That'll happen when we get there. This side of heaven, here's the good news. God's going to make sure you always need faith in your life so you're always pleasing to him. 
Always pleasing to him. We need faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Number three, because without faith, we have the potential to stop the activity of God in our lives. Without faith, think about that. It says in Mark chapter 6 that Jesus, uh, when he went to Nazareth, and they all went, hang on a second, you're, we know you. Our kids played backyard soccer with you. You, know, you used to come over to our house and steal wood and the rubber hammer and pretend to build things. You made the chairs in my lounge room. I'm, uh. And it says that he could do no mighty works there. Mark chapter 6 verse 5, he could do no mighty works there except heal a few minor ailments. In the Greek, that's literally what it means, a few minor ailments, like a couple of headaches. Hasn't time changed? I mean, once upon a time, imagine if two guys had rip, roar, and migraines here, we got you up the front, prayed for you, and you were healed. We would call that a revival today, wouldn't we? Yet Jesus says, ah, that's nothing. That's nothing. He says that he healed a few minor ailments. They went, that's not what it's about, man. I want to do so much more in your life. I want to do so much more in your community. I want to do so much more for you. But it says the reason why they couldn't was because of their unbelief, their lack of this thing we're going to talk about called faith. So think about that. I don't know if any of you ever think about where your faith's at and, 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 and what you really believe and so on. But he's saying here that without faith, an environment that's devoid of faith has the capacity and power to stop the activity of God. It says that he could do no mighty work there. It does not say he didn't want to do. It's very clear. Jesus came there with an expectation that he was going to do something great. And when he rocked up, there was such low faith there that for some reason, I don't get it. I just know it's there. For some reason, the lack of faith in that community held back what God wanted to do. I wonder sometimes with churches whether God wants to do so much more, but is he held back sometimes by the lack of expectation and faith that people have? I don't know. But because of the power of that, I reckon it's worth spending a few weeks looking at this issue of faith and talking about faith. Number one, God has an expectation. His followers will have it. Number two, without faith, we'll never truly please God. Number three, without faith, we have the potential to stop the activity of God in our lives. Number four, because with faith, all things become possible. With faith, all things become possible. Now, some people misinterpret that, don't they? They say, with faith, all things become guaranteed. That's not what Jesus ever said. Jesus never said, with faith, it's all guaranteed. And if you can find that verse, come and show it to me. I'm always open to learn. But I cannot find anywhere where Jesus said, with faith it's guaranteed. No, no. Jesus said, with faith all things become possible. How many of you know there's a difference between something being possibility and something being guaranteed? Yeah? It's totally different. Some people have taken passages like that and we've reinterpreted them to mean, with faith it's guaranteed. And how many faiths, how many people's relationships with God have been shipwrecked because of this misinterpretation, slight misinterpretation, it's guaranteed and it doesn't work and they fall off the perch and go, well, forget that stuff. No, 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 it all comes back to what's your understanding of faith. All things become possible, not guaranteed, but all things definitely become possible. And number five, the last reason why we're going to spend time on it is because I think we've actually forgotten what real faith is. I actually think that we have forgotten what real faith actually is. Is. Something, something happened back in the, well, it started in the 60s with certain preachers and things and then progressed into the 70s. By the 80s, it became a bit more solidified and the 90s, it became, uh, we call it a movement, but it's not technically a denomination or anything, but it's just a train of thinking. And, and I don't want to pick apart if anybody's into it, that's fine. I'm just here telling you what I believe. This thing called the Word of Faith Movement. Anyone ever heard of the Word of Faith Movement? Again, some wonderful people involved in it. I'm not judging the people. I'm not judging their hearts. What I'm looking at is the teaching itself in comparison to the broader picture of, of what these ancient documents teach us about God and about life. And, and, and what happened was this, this, this kind of movement came. And to be honest with you, I believe that most of the time when movements come in church history, it's because the church needs to be reminded of something. We forget grace. So a guy like Martin Luther comes along and nails his thesis at Wittenberg. And all of a sudden, grace becomes this big thing. And any time there's a movement that, when God reminds the church of a particular thing, you know what happens? We go to a complete extreme with it, but then it balances back eventually. And then God reminds us of something else. It goes to an extreme, the prophetic, and then it comes back. And then he reminds us of the apostolic, and it goes to a complete extreme, but eventually it balances back. And I think what happened with the Word of Faith movement was that God was trying to say to us, hey, people... Don't forget faith. 
Don't forget there's a God out there that heals the sick. Don't forget there's a God there that delivers. Don't forget there's a God there that can provide for you. Don't forget that there's a God out there that wants to interact with you. Don't forget there's a God out there that can solve problems, that can help you get through the difficulties. Don't forget that. And so this, this emphasis on faith came back. But the problem is that it kind of went to a complete extreme where I think somewhere in the mix of that, we kind of lost sight of, hang on a second, what is pure biblical faith? What does the Bible teach about faith? I know, it, I know what certain teachers teach about faith, but what does the Word of God actually teach me about faith in the context of the broader picture of the teachings of Scripture, in the context of the broader character and nature of God and His interactions with people? I think that we've forgotten what faith is really about. Now, the positive of the word of faith is this, that it reminded us of the importance and power of faith. The negative is that it turned faith into something it was never meant to be by appealing to what we all wish it was, a means to get whatever it is that my heart desires. Isn't that right? It, it, it turned faith into this thing that, that, that was what, what the human uh, uh, nature craved. I want a God that... Who doesn't want a God that gives them everything they want? I... Wouldn't it be great? I want, if I could find a God, like a real God that was really there, not, not a golden calf I created, but a real God that came down and said, hey, I'll give you whatever you want, I'd follow him. I'd go after him. If a God came and said, you can have whatever you want, when you want, because you want, I'll tell you what, by Jesus, I'm going over to him. But there is no other God. There's only one God. So I don't have that option. So I've got to work with the God that is real and make the adjustments I need to in my life to do things his way, because he's not going to adjust to do things my way. Faith has been turned into a means to get whatever it is that my heart desires. Faith has become something we need to acquire in order to acquire what we think we need. And that's not what faith is. And so we're going to spend some time over the next four or five weeks. We're going to unpack faith and look at this issue of faith. One of the reasons why I want to do it, I had an experience some years back in a church in Bundaberg, many years back, and uh, uh, we'd been in India, we came home, and I was preaching in this church, and it happened to be a Word of Faith church, I'm not picking on them, just, it just happened to be. And the, the, the pastor there is a great mate of ours, probably one of the best Bible teachers, to be honest, to this day I've ever met, he was brilliant. But I was in that church, and I'm preaching, and I stood up, and I started to talk a little bit about faith, and I said, you know, how many of you are, you know, believe that God, God is a healing God, and Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, the Bible, and they're, yeah, amen, woo, woo, all this, yeah. And they said, and how many of you have, have currently got colds? You can't see properly out of your eyes. You go, hey, you got this, you go to a doctor, and it went silent. And I said, how many of you right now believe that, you know, God is, is Jehovah Jireh, my provider, and he'll meet all your needs, and, and all your, your, you know, financially, and blah, 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 and they're like, yeah, yeah, we believe, woo. I said, now, how many of you have got a bunch of bills on your fridge being held on by a magnet that you haven't been able to pay yet? And it just went quiet. And I went through a few scenarios. I wasn't belittling or making fun of or mocking. What was really interesting is at the end of that service, a couple of things happened. First of all, after potentially people sitting there thinking, I've just belittled faith and ripped out faith and made fun of faith, my son stopped breathing. Do you remember that? My, 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 our, our son Jordan was being nursed by a girl in the church. All of a sudden, he stopped breathing. We just hear this scream. And she comes running over to us with this baby. And he's not breathing. And it happened like that. We didn't know what to do. So we just put hands on him and just said, in Jesus' name, God, be healed. And by the mercy and grace of God, <laughs> he starts breathing again. Why did that happen in that moment? I don't know why it happened in that moment. But for me personally, it became a very significant thing. It's okay to question things. It's okay to question faith in that situation, you know. It was okay to say, hey, you know what? I believe in healing God, but I don't understand why I'm not always healed. I believe in a God who provides, but I don't understand why I've got a couple of bills at home that haven't been paid yet. I believe in a God, that, but I don't understand. It's okay. There's a mystery to God. And the Christian faith is not about coming to a place where we understand everything about God. That's not the goal. The goal is not to know everything about God. It's to get to know God. To the best of our ability as human beings, get to know the divine creator of the world and walk with him daily in an intimate relationship with him. But the other exciting thing or interesting thing that happened at the end of that service was this. One by one, people came up to me when nobody else was around. I felt like Jesus and Nicodemus, you know, comes at night when no one's around. Look, they just came up to me when I was pulling me away with a coffee in the quiet and go, you know, I, I, I really resonate with what you said. I thought I was the only person that thought about that. And I remember walking away from that service and going to Jackie, you would not believe how many people came up to me 
I'm thinking, if you all got together and started talking about some of those things and you realise the guy sitting left and right of you thinks the same as you, wow, couldn't God have something to work with? Couldn't you start, to start this journey of actually growing your faith instead of pretending that you know what it's all about when you don't? Instead of thinking faith is this thing over here and high-fiving and rah haring this is what faith is, but over here you actually don't believe that. But you put on the image that you feel like you have to. So faith for me is a really, really important thing. Here's, here's the reality. We want a faith that changes individual circumstances. But more importantly, God wants a faith that changes individuals. Amen? We might, we might settle for a faith that changes a situation or a circumstance, but God, godly, biblical faith is not about changing individual circumstances. It's about changing individuals. Amen? So if there's anybody here and you're interested in going on a little bit of a journey with us for the next four or five weeks and digging in to this topic of faith, then can I encourage you to begin to pray and ask God to open your heart, open your eyes, open your ears and to listen to what the Holy Spirit may have for you as we go on this journey together. I don't claim to be a faith expert and I don't claim to know everything about everything. But I do want to share some things from the Word of God that God's laid on my heart because I do believe that faith is a really, really, really important thing. It's an important part of our journey. It's an important part of what we believe. But we've got to understand what faith is and why we need to have it and what becomes possible with faith if we're going to be, I guess, truly the people that God wants us to be. Amen?